This week, I finished uh, the best book I've ever read about a saint. It's called A Man for Others, Maximilian Kolbe, the Saint of Auschwitz. In the words of those who knew him, it's somewhat of a eulogy, a long description, eyewitness testimonies of Maximilian Kolbe. Amazing book. I'd like to just share with you his story again today and apply it to today's gospel. Maximilian Kolbe was born in Poland in 1894 bit of a rebellious kid at times growing up, and one day his mom took him aside from the rest of the family, and she said to him, what will become of you? And that night he took this question in prayer, what will become of me? And the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to him that night, and she had two crowns. She had a white crown for chastity and a red crown for martyrdom, and she said, pick one. And he reached out and said, both. And from that childhood experience at the age of 12, he said that his singular goal in life was to become a saint and a great one. And his number one principle, the way he would do this, is to love without limit. To love without limit. So think about that. This is somewhat of an interpretive key to understand the entire life of Maximilian Kolbe. It is singular goal in life was to become a great saint and he was going to do it by loving without limit. A year after he had this vision, he entered the Franciscan minor seminary, the high school. And at the age of 18, he was sent off to Rome for further studies. He got two doctorates in a seven-year period in Rome. And after he came back with two doctorates, he went to Japan for four years as a missionary. And then he came back to Poland, and he started the biggest monastery in the world. Soon after that, though, the Nazis came and arrested Father Kolbe and sent him to Auschwitz, which is the worst of all the death camps that the Germans had. And for over three months in Auschwitz, Father Kolbe, what did he try to do? To become a saint and a great one. And how was he going to do it? Love without limit. To fellow prisoners, He, as a priest, risked his own life by celebrating secret masses at night whenever they could find a little bit of bread and wine. He heard their confessions as they were working, and he would even give away his food. Why would he do it? His singular goal, to be a great saint, to love without limit. And to the prison guards, who had a special hatred for priests, who gave them the worst of all jobs in the camp, he would often be calm and serene. He's the only one who never cursed or complained about the prison guards, even when they beat him almost to death multiple times. Why? He wanted to be a great saint, and he was going to do it by loving without limit, and that includes the Nazi prison guards. And so one guard later remarked in the book, giving an eyewitness testimony, he said that Father Colby, they could not stand this man looking at him. The prison guards, they couldn't stand Father Colby looking at them. And so they would often say, look at the ground, not at us. Anyone know why? Why would they say to this man, look at the ground, not at us? He was the only prisoner in the camp that they said did not look for hunger, for finding bread, but he looked to liberate them from evil. Whereas every other prisoner had a look of selfishness to try to get bread to survive, to make it through the camp. Father Colby had a whole different goal, to be a great saint. He was going to do it by loving without limit. And so after three months of this daily sacrificial love, in July 1941, his life would be forever remembered when one prisoner escaped from the camp. And this was bad news. Everyone knew it. Because what would happen, the camp commander would gather together the remaining prisoners, and one by one, he would choose 10 men to be starved to death in an underground bunker. This was known as the pit of hell in Auschwitz, the worst way of all to die. 
And so just imagine yourself there. You're among the crowd, and the camp commander slowly walks through each line and then picks you, you. And one of the men, Francis Gawinichi, fell down to his knees and he said, my wife, my kids. Suddenly, though, someone stepped out of line. And it was Father Colby. And he immediately walked past the SS guards with their guard dogs, right up to the camp commander. And fellow prisoners later recalled that the camp commander was shaking in the presence of Father Colby. This great big German man was shaking in the presence of this frail old Father Colby. And so he said, what do you want to Father Colby? Father Colby said, I want to take his place. He said, what are you, crazy? Who are you? He said, I am a Catholic priest. And because the camp commander hates priests, in a decision never done before in Auschwitz, he said, request granted. And he let Francis Gawinichi go back into line and Father Colby to take his place. And he hoped that this would put an end to Father Colby forever and his influence on all the other prisoners. But in that underground bunker known as the pit of hell, instead of hearing the usual cursing and cries, they heard hymns of praise to God. Father Colby was leading the other men in prayer. One of the SS guards walked in to see what was happening, and the men were so wrapped in prayer that they didn't even notice the man was there. He had to push them to wake them up from their pretty much ecstasy in prayer. And as one after another the men died, Father Colby absolved them of their sins before their death. And then his last act was to reach out his arm, and as they injected him with carbolic acid to end his life, he blessed the man who executed him. But rather than silence Father Colby, the Auschwitz prisoners who survived said that his heroic act of volunteering to die in the worst way possible for a stranger sent shockwaves throughout the camp. On the lips of everyone, Nazis included, they said, this is genuine love of neighbor. And he inspired thousands. The majority of prisoners who survived Auschwitz personally met Father Colby. And so they said his death was the salvation of thousands of prisoners who inspired them to persevere beyond the camp but also to respond to hatred and evil by love and forgiveness. In today's gospel, Jesus gives some very serious words about a time of great suffering and darkness. And for the Jews, it would be the end of their world. And this was fulfilled in their time. If you know history, 40 years after this prophecy from Jesus, the Romans came into Jerusalem, they killed 1.2 million Jews, and they destroyed the temple, which was for them the center of their world. They felt like everything was over. And in a similar way with Father Colby, from a young age, from the prophecy of Mary about the crown of martyrdom, to multiple times Jesus telling him that there would be a time in which the Polish nation would undergo great suffering and darkness. And you, they would feel like their whole identity is stripped away from them. And that happened. The Nazis came in, killed millions of Polish people. In a similar way, the same is true for us might not necessarily be war, but I think all of us can agree that we are in a time of great suffering and darkness. Maybe not to the extent of war, but certainly morality itself is very dark, dark times today. 
And as Jesus prophesies about the end of the world, we all know for certain the one fact we all share in common is death. Every single one of us here is going to die. Every single one of us. And what do you want to be known for? Just as Maximilian Kolbe's mother asked him at the age of 12, what will become of you? What do you want to be known for? Honestly, this book is a eulogy of Maximilian Kolbe. If someone had to write your book today, what would be written? 